friends, welcome to another edition of Orlando Attractions Magazine, the show. On today's episode, we'll be bringing you another report from the Epcot Flower and Garden Festival, SeaWorld's release of their 1,000 sea turtle. Yeah, a special interview with the Hidden Mickey's author. We're also going to check in on nesting egrets at Gatorland. We'll get a high-in-the-sky construction update at Disney and much more. Hey guys, this is Jessica Steele Allen. And joining me is the one and only Greg Hudson. Oh, I like that. Now, as we do each week, we'll be bringing you the latest attractions, news, and information from around Central Florida. If you'd like more details about the things we cover on the show, you can find it on our website at attractionsmagazine.com. That's right. Well, as we have previously reported, the Epcot International Flower and Garden Festival opened last week, and it's going to run until mid-May. We're happy to report that the Cars 2 topiary is now in place and Lotso finally joined Woody and Buzz Lightyear in the entrance garden. If you like strawberries, be sure to take a deep breath as you walk by Lotso. And since butterflies are such a popular attraction for festival visitors, the area was made larger this year. In fact, it's double the size of last year's. And our kid reporters, Mindy and Quinn, paid a visit to Bambi's Butterfly House. Let's see how many butterflies you can spot. <laughs> First thing you want to do when you visit Bambi's Butterfly House is pick up one of these guys. And once you get the guide, you can look at it and look at all the different butterflies that you can see here. I want to see the 88 one. I want to see the blue one. Let's go. Let's go. <gasps> They're mostly monarchs. Look at that one. Oh, cool. Let's. That's it's a pearl crescent. But the, oh, wait, honey, wait, that it's one. a Julia. Julia. Hello, Julia. You can learn all about the butterfly life cycle. They go from an egg to a larvae or a caterpillar, and then a larvae or caterpillar to a chrysalis or pupa, and then to the adult butterfly. It's a giant flower. Out of all the flowers here, this one's my favorite. Well, there you have it. Bambi's Butterfly House. Another event being showcased at Epcot this coming weekend is a trialon. It's part of Disney's Magic of Healthy Living, a national multimedia initiative designed to join with parents in their goal to raise healthy, happy kids. Yep, 50 young essay winners from across the country will have fun alongside Disney Channel stars and participate in the creative course around the world where kids will get to try new food, new moves, and new ways to live healthy. We'll be bringing you highlights on next week's show. Mm-hmm. Now this week was an exciting week for SeaWorld's Animal Rescue and Rehabilitation Team. Listen to this, they just released their 1,000th 1, 1, rehabilitated sea turtle at Canaveral National Seashore. Our teen reporter Thomas was there to cover the event. Take a look. Hello Attractions fans, I'm here at the beach, which is only an hour away from Orlando. And, well, you can't really see any sea creatures here, but if you want to, you can always go to SeaWorld, which brings me to my next point. SeaWorld is about to release their 1,000th rescued sea turtle, and we are here to cover it for you. Our morning started at the Sea Turtle Rescue and Rehabilitation Center at the SeaWorld Park. First, they loaded up the turtles into the backs of vans, but the turtles, they kind of just sat there and enjoyed it. After all the sea turtles were loaded, we took our hour-long drive over to the Canaveral National Seashore, and there, 
we talked to the aquarium manager, Dan Conklin, about the sea turtles. Let's see what he had to say. Well, sea turtles are believed to live 75 more years, and they, they mature very slowly. It could take them 20, 25 years to reach maturity uh, before they can start producing more sea turtles. So it's hard to say how old these guys are. These guys are, oh, I don't know, probably 10, 15 years old. Sub-adults. Teenagers. Well, today we're releasing a number of sea turtles, one of which is actually our 1,000th uh, sea turtle that SeaWorld has released. Now, the lagoon system behind me, uh, we just released six sea turtles out there, and we're going to release two more sea turtles over on the ocean side of uh, Cape Canaveral National Seashore. And our 1,000th release is going to be out there on the ocean side. And the reason we're releasing in two different locations is because the sea turtles that were released here were rescued from this area. Now the sea turtles that were releasing in the ocean side, they were actually from the ocean side to begin with, so that's why we're doing it in two different spots. Once we had finished releasing turtles on the lagoon side, we walked over to the ocean side to release Mr. 1000. This lucky sea turtle was special though. Unlike the others, he was set on the beach instead of being directly put in the water. So he flippered his way down the beach and it was so cool that I got down there with my iPhone and started videoing him. And even at one point, the turtle followed me towards the water. It was so rad. been behind if he came up at the right time and I didn't get to see him but you almost almost always get a chance to see him one more time. Now when you're taking care of him do you get emotionally attached? I mean like are you happy that he's gone or are you sad? <laughs> it's it's mixed feelings for sure. You're happy that he's out there you know, back doing what he's doing but at the same time you spent so much time with him you know helping him recover. Um, you do develop somewhat of an attachment and bond to them, but uh, it's nice to see him go too. It's what it's all about. Okay, well, thank you, Dan. Well, there's a lot of sights and sounds going on at Gatorland this month. The egrets are busy nesting and breeding, and it's all taking place among growling alligators. Now, Attractions Magazine contributor Don takes us on a journey through the ponds and marshes at Gatorland in this relaxing and a bit humorous video. Oh, and keep an eye out for the towers on the horizon. They're for the upcoming zipline attraction scheduled to open this summer. Well, we had an extra special treat here at our studios earlier. Stephen Barrett, he's the author of the Hidden Mickey's book series, and he stopped by for an interview, and JD was on hand to talk to him. 
Hey guys, for any of you who've ever explored the Walt Disney World parks, you may have seen Disney shapes all over the place. Well, some of those constitute being called a hidden Mickey, and guess what? There's even a guidebook out there for that called Hidden Mickeys, a field guide to Walt Disney World's biggest secrets. And right here, right next to me, I have Stephen M. Barrett, the author of this book, and so let's have a few questions with him. First of all, I want to ask you, how did you get started creating this field guide? Well, I wrote a guidebook first for Walt Disney World, and my publisher asked me if I had any other ideas for books. And so I said, I've nice. been collecting hidden Mickeys, so let's put it together in a book. So that's how it happened. So I had a big file, and I put them together in scavenger hunts. It's not just a catalog of hidden Mickeys, it's actually efficient scavenger hunts. So that if you wanted to go to the Magic Kingdom and try to find as many hidden Mickeys as you want to, it's, the scavenger hunts are put together efficiently, so you don't waste time waiting in lines. Oh, nice. So it's, uh, it's really, really efficient. Well, tell me, um, looking into the first chapter, Chapter 2, Magic Kingdom Scavenger Hunt, what are some of your favorites? At the Magic Kingdom, I would say walking down Main Street, Yeah, you got to check into Tony's Restaurant. Tony. There is a wonderful hidden Mickey on a tile on the floor. Uh, as you walk into the seating area, you go left, huh? and look down at a black tile, and there's a tiny hidden Mickey impression in the tile. And it's, it's, a, it's one of those hidden Mickeys that I love, because it's really hard to find. Yeah. And once you see it, oh my gosh, that's a great hidden Mickey. Nice, very so, cool. So on Main Street, another really good one is, is uh, that's been there a while is in the Emporium in one of the outside display windows in the Aladdin scene. There's a great hidden Mickey window, tiny in the Aladdin buildings. So you have to see that one. Now not all display window hidden Mickeys stay around, but this one has been there for a number of years, so I hope it stays. Well, you know, thanks a ton for uh, all this information. This is some wonderful stuff, and I definitely learned a ton about hidden Mickeys. So thank you so sure, much JD. for joining us today, Steve. My Steven. pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, back to you guys. You know, I love finding hidden Mickeys. It's like the biggest ongoing scavenger <laughs> hut ever. One of my favorites is the Mickey made out of rocks on the bottom of the main aquarium at the Seas with Nemo and Friends. Mm, excellent. Now guys, we've just shown you part of our interview today, but be sure to tune in on future episodes for more from Steve Barrett. Now changing gears a bit, from time to time, we like to stroll through the theme parks and take a look at things that are often overlooked by busy attraction-seeking visitors. And recently we made such a visit to SeaWorld and we found some interesting things, right Jess? We did. Now for instance, here's a sign giving guests texting directions where they can get answers to questions about the park. It's a great way to find out information such as park hours, show times, and wait times. The good thing is that you don't even have to be in the park to text your question. Wow. And, and these fake palm trees were spotted in Happy Harbor. And why are they fake, you ask? Well, it's pretty simple. Those palm fronds will be sending out a nice cooling mist on a hot summer day. And families with young kids will find the Nanny Caddy vending machines a great attraction to have in the park. Well, guys, the Easter Bunny has come to town early this year. You can see the characters from the new movie Hop at Universal Studios from now until April 5th and the E.B., Fluffy, Carlos, and Friends can be seen at the stage near the E.T. ride, and they're starring in the upcoming live-action CG animated feature film, and that is scheduled to debut April 1st. And during Mardi Gras days at Universal, check out this kid's show on the same stage called Mardi Party Crew. Shaggy, Scooby-Doo, The Man in the Yellow Hat, Curious George, and Woody and Winnie Woodpecker perform in their Mardi Gras outfit. They'll also be available to meet guests for photos. Well, attention G.I. Joe collectors, the 18th annual official G.I. Joe convention, appropriately named G.I. Joe Con, is coming to town. So mark your calendars for April 2nd and 3rd and be at the Walt Disney World Dolphin Hotel for the launching of more than 300 parachuting G.I. Joe figures off the roof. The event will feature rare and vintage figurines, special guests, they're going to have costume contests as well, a whole lot more. And on opening day, the first 100 kids aged 12 and younger will receive a free G.I. Joe gift. Now, if you're a fan of comic books, sci-fi, action figures, costumes, and other cool pop culture icons, you do not want to miss Megacon's return to the Orange County Convention Center on March 25th, 26th, and 27th. Well, we decided to join in the fun at SeaWorld's Viva La Musica last Saturday. Chino y Nacho added the heat to the fiesta with their live performance and you can also enjoy traditional Latin menu items from South America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And the Fiesta will run each Saturday through April 2nd. 
Appearing this Saturday will be Manny Manuel, and at Busch Gardens Fiesta, Jose Alberto El Canario will take the stage. Now over at Universal's Mardi Gras concert, the Neon Trees will be appearing this Friday, and The Roots, one of my personal favorites, will be performing on Saturday. And finally, Chubby Checker and the Wildcats will be at the Epcot Flower Power Series all weekend. We know how you like to stay updated on all the construction going on around Disney World. So, we dropped by the Magic Kingdom this week and spotted some interesting changes. Yeah, that's right. The new sign is up for Town Square Theater. It's formerly known as Exposition Hall, and this is where you'll be able to get the Fast Pass to meet Mickey when he moves in later this spring. On a hill next to It's a Small World sits the abandoned Skyway building. It's rumored that it will be torn down soon to make way for new restrooms, while across the walkway next to the Peter Pan attraction, it said those restrooms will be moved to the Skyway building spot. Hmm, I wonder if that means that there's a new interactive queue that's coming to Peter Pan's flight. Interactive queues do seem to be all the rage at Disney right now, so maybe. Yep, and construction continues for Fantasyland expansion, and you know us, we like to go above and beyond to get the news, and instead of going over the fence, we chose to go up and beyond for an aerial shot. Take a look at this aerial video. As you can see, work has not yet begun for the new Seven Dwarfs Mine Train ride. However, they are making progress on the Little Mermaid ride, along with Beast Castle and Belle's Cottage. Also, you'll notice all that's left in former Toontown are the tents and Barnstormer, and Mickey and Minnie's house, Donald's boat, and everything else in the area has been destroyed. The new interactive queue outside the Haunted Mansion is almost ready to open. Here's a look at a couple of the areas. Once it fully opens, we'll bring you more coverage. Hi, I'm Eric Goodman with Walt Disney Imagineering. We're here in our new interactive queue that we've created for the Haunted Mansion at the Magic Kingdom. We want to give you guys a sneak peek at what we're doing. And you know what? We have the perfect setting for today because it's raining really hard and it's really a little spooky. So uh, let's go take a look at what we've created. Come on, follow me. Now this is the entrance into our new queue area. It's actually a whole new graveyard that we've set up. We've got a great view uh, onto the River of Americas and uh, you'll see that some of your old favorites are still going to be around. Hey, I know this guy. One of the things that people have always enjoyed in the Haunted Mansion Cemetery are the tombstones with the dark, funny epitaphs on them. What a lot of people don't know is those are actually tributes to the famous Imagineers who worked on the show. And we're out in front of the uh, composer crypt right now, and up overhead here you can see the raven. Uh, we, we had this raven motif sculpted um, so that we could keep some of the famous recurring characters from the Haunted Mansion and bring them all the way out here into the, into the queue so that guests start to experience them from right in the first scene. Because the mansion is kind of a, a fine balance between uh, dark and funny. This is the grave for Prudence Pock. She's the poetess here. And she uh, she's related to Phineas Pock, which is a famous Haunted Mansion character. But, uh, but we, we, so we're, we're adding new stuff at the same time we're referencing the old. This tomb was based on a character that was originally created for the, uh, the mansion by Ken Anderson. The story, it was about the sea captain and his wife. And the one-eyed cat was another character that was intended to be recurring, just like the raven, but never made it into the show. And so now, finally, the one-eyed cat is here. Did you hear that? Cool. The composer's tomb has two sides of instruments, which are interactive. And of course, when you play with them, they, they sound as weird as they look. It was all done in one night. It was uh, a lot of guys, a lot of muscle, and a lot of pre-planning was put into it so that we could get these crypts in and uh, get the wall back up in time for the park to open the next morning at 7 a.m. It's been an amazing experience to work with this great team and come together to build something that's really gonna be great for the guests. Thanks for stopping by our little sneak peek of the new experience. Hope you have a great day, and make sure you look for those details in there. There's a lot of fun stuff. Take care. The new spring edition of our magazine is coming out in a couple of weeks, and we have a sneak peek at the cover for you here. The spring issue will be available for purchase on our website soon, and it'll also be available at your favorite major bookstore and on our free iPad app. The magazine is the perfect companion, along with our show, to keep you updated on all the happenings in Central Florida. Hey Greg, I have a riddle for you. Huh? It was big 
12 feet wide and seven and a half feet tall, purple and evil. Wow, like, I don't know, some sort of really mean, big giant raisin, California raisin? I have no clue. Yes, nothing. I was going to say, it's, it's Grimace. Okay. No, it's no, 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 no. Actually, you poor <laughs> unfortunate soul, it is Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Only this huge Ursula is the new audio animatronic one going into The Little Mermaid attraction in California. We want to show you this one because uh, the ride here at Disney World will be just like the one in California on the inside. Take a look. Ursula has arrived. Hi, I'm Frank Antonides, Director of Project Management with Walt Disney Imagineering. We're here in the Little Mermaid attraction where it's a very exciting day for us. The Ursula figure has arrived and has been situated in her lair here in the attraction. While we have a lot of work to do in order to get her ready to show our guests, we want to share a little bit of the magic with you back at our production facility in North Hollywood. Ursula is one of the biggest animated characters we've ever done. She's huge. It's gonna knock your socks off. I admit that in the past I've been a nasty. They weren't kidding when they called me well a witch. My name is Larry Nikolai. I'm the show designer and the creative director for The Little Mermaid Attraction. We're at our animation facility and we are going through our preliminary programming where we finally see her moving and acting like Ursula. She's huge, she's 12 feet wide, she's seven and a half feet tall. She just sort of fills this whole scene with this cauldron in front of her. Poor unfortunate souls, so sad, so true. Hi, my name is Tom Mathias. I'm principal figure finishing artisan. I'm responsible for the figure finishing of all the figures in the mermaid attraction. So that covers the paint and the costume and the hair on all of the figures. When we first started producing the Ursula figure, we researched by watching the film at least 20, 30 times and taking still grabs of it so that we could tell what she looked like in fine detail. And then we have to start finding materials that are gonna let us represent that in a real world, but work the way we need to. So like her body, we ended up choosing a stretch velvet so that she had a very luxurious look, but still very smooth, but able to move with her well. The rest of her skin is actually a flexible rubber that allows her to make facial expressions and move her arms and face and everything else. My name is Ethan Reed. I'm a senior show animator at Walt Disney Imagineering on the Little Mermaid attraction. This character is going to be one of the most amazing audiomatronics I've ever animated. My favorite function on Ursula is her body squash and stretch. When we were watching the film early on, we noticed how much squash and stretch they got in the torso when they were animating her. So I really pushed hard to get that function put in her torso. And you know, we have the typical torso functions that you have on an audiomatronic figure, but she can bounce to the music. When she hits a high note, we can stretch her torso up. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> The plastics department and the mechanical department here at Walt Disney Imagineering has really pulled an amazing feat here with her skin. She can stretch her elbow all the way straight and she can bring it all the way back in and the skin keeps its shape. She has little lip sneers and she has eyebrow functions and she has analog eyelids so she can squint her eyes and you can really get some fun play in her eye area because yeah, that's where guests are going to look first. It's remarkable. We just want people to be entertained. That's right. We just want you to be entertained. And Ursula is pretty amazing, but you're gonna have to come see her for yourself when The Little Mermaid Ariel's Undersea Adventure opens on June 3rd. Well guys, as you know, each week we like to focus on our fans and today we're gonna respond to a couple of questions we received. We've got the first one here, it is from Wyatt M11. He wants to know, could you tell some of the rumors about the expansion of the wizarding world of Harry Potter? Well. Wyatt M11. Some Universal officials have hinted that there might be an expansion, but we haven't heard any facts yet. Now, the rumors we've heard are just that the expansion would take over the Lost Continent area. We also heard there may be some new areas added from the new film, or that part of what you can see now in The Three Broomsticks may be featured in the final film. So, as soon as we know something, we'll let you know, buddy. Elizabeth Duran from Maine wrote, any idea on what's going to be the easiest, least expensive way to get from a Disney resort to Legoland when it opens in the fall? That's a great question, Elizabeth. The easiest way would be to rent a car, but that's not the least expensive way. Legoland will have some sort of transportation available from Orlando, but it hasn't been finalized yet. But even after it is, you'll probably need to find a way from your Disney resort to wherever the bus picks up unless they'll offer hotel pickup. We'll just have to wait and see what options Legoland provides as their opening date gets closer. 
And listen, we appreciate all of you for watching and commenting on the show. And if you have questions or you'd like to send a video, please do so. We'd love to hear from you, always. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to another broadcast of Orlando Attractions Magazine, the show. You want to be sure to join us next week as we come to you on location at Sammy Duval's Water Sports Center at the Contemporary Resort. And remember, there are several ways you can see our show and follow our news reports on YouTube and HD. Yeah, on iTunes, where you can subscribe. On Twitter, at Attractions. On Facebook.com slash Attractions Magazine. And, of course, at AttractionsMagazine.com, where you can get more information on the stories we highlight on our show, sign up for our free weekly email newsletter, and much more. So from all of us here at Orlando Attractions Magazine, the show, have fun! fun.